topic today is recruiting, and I'm, I'm excited to do recruiting because it's in my wheelhouse. It's something that I've been teaching on. I have a signature training that I've done for years and years, uh, mostly to my team, uh, mostly in Europe and the United States, but the fact that we're global makes it really exciting because I get to meet some of you for the first time and be able to share some of my techniques with some of you for the first time. So uh, my formal background is college teaching. Um, I uh, taught at a major university, and um, in fact, when I was introduced to network marketing, I was introduced by a colleague who was a professor at that university, and I needed a way to make some extra income. It was during the summer, and I took off like gangbusters, but then when the school year started, I was teaching full-time. I was going to graduate school in the evening to finish my PhD, and I was also, the, the university had asked me if I would coach one of their collegiate teams, and so I had such little time. I mean, I had very little time to build the business. And so and about 15 months later, I realized I was not giving the business the time it deserved. And I found a way to really focus in on the key things that would really help make for a successful business. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. So anyway, my topic is recruit like a pro. And first off, I'd like to share with you that when I was analyzing the business, when I was frustrated because it wasn't growing, I came to the realization that when I talked to some of the most successful people, it seemed like they were really good at two things. And I call it the highest paid skills. And those were recruiting and promoting. And when you think of promoting, you think of people who are out there telling you about the latest event, make sure you get to this university, make sure you get to this convention. Um, they're telling you about uh, someone's testimonial, they're telling you about results on a product. That's promoting, and the more you promote, the more interest you create that people want to see the business or they want to try the product. Um, that's a, a, a skill that you really need to work on because it's essential in building a business. Today, what I'm going to focus on is the other essential skill, which is called recruiting. And because I'm a teacher, I'm going to teach you from beginning to more advanced. I'm going to try to take you through some steps here. At the same time, I hope you're taking notes because I'm going to be moving quite quickly in this time frame. So when you think of recruiting, recruiting consists of really four things. The invitation, the pre presentation, the uh, follow-up, and then the close or sign-up. And so that is what recruiting is. But I want to tell you something. The people who are most successful are brilliant at the first thing, which is invitation. They know how to create curiosity. They know how to create an interest um, that makes people want to know more about what you're doing. And so if you're going to be an expert at anything, be an expert at the invitation. Because I have seen people that are the most successful in the business. They're not necessarily the best presenters or the best trainers, but boy, are they good at the invitation. The other thing I want to mention, too, is the invitation and the follow follow-up are both, um, they're both probably um, the ego area of the business. In other words, this is the area that you, you are, have the most ego risk. In other words, that is where if you're going to get a no or you're going to get rejection, it's either going to be at the invitation, no, I'm not interested in seeing the business, or it's going to be at the follow-up, I've seen it, no, I'm not interested in getting involved. And so this is the area I think people fall down in, in the recruiting uh, arena. In other words, they either don't put themselves out there to do the invitation, or they've done the invitation, they've done the presentation, now they're scared to do a follow-up because they don't want to get a no. And so if you can overcome those two areas and, and, and work on those ego risk areas, it can make all the difference in your recruiting skills. So first of all, let's talk about contacts. I call them contacts because that's what they are. They're contacts. They might turn into business associates. I don't usually use the word prospecting. I always feel like it's synonymous with victim or something. I stay with the word contact. And so your contacts are going to be people you know, people that are acquaintances, and people you don't know. And what I want to do is I want to cover all three areas. So first, let's talk about people you know and acquaintances, because that's the easiest. And let me tell you what I suggest to a new person when they first start. I say make a list. Now, you can make a list on your computer. You can use your contacts in your phone and make a list on your phone. Um, you can make a, a list on a, a, a pad and paper or whatever. When I first started the business, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have mobile phones. 
And uh, yes, the telephone was invented. But the point of it was, is I had to do everything on with pen and paper. So what I suggest to people is make a list of everyone you know. And they say, Paula, that's crazy. I mean, everyone I know that could take me days. Yes, but it could make you a fortune. A list of everyone you know. Just start thinking everyone you've known from the time you were a kid to every place you've lived, to every place you've worked, to every organization you belong to, every school you attended. Just empty your brain because your brain is your memory uh, center, but it's also a place where you strategize. If you can put the memory in front of you, then it leaves your brain free to strategize. So make a list and then categorize and organize the list. And let me tell you how I do that. I focus on something called want. What do people want? People are thinking, what's in it for me, Paula? What's in it for me? You know, if I talk about, hey, I got a way you could, um, you know, make this kind of income or you could do this or that, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they want. You know, some people, maybe they're in a job that they hate. Um, maybe they're in debt. I don't know. But what I want to do is focus on wants. So once I've made this list, I go through the list three times. The first time I go through it, I check off everyone that's like me. Who's like you on that list? Who's ambitious? Who'd like to be in business for themselves? Who wants more? That's, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for people like you. And you know who these people are because they're people that you like to hang out with. Because you talk about things. You're not just talking about people, but you're talking about things and ideas. And you know, I'm, I tell people, I say, I, I'm always looking for someone who's ambitious, someone who's a self-starter, someone who's positive, and someone who's coachable. Nothing's worse than being around negative people who are not coachable. So that's the qualifications I'm looking for. Then I, I check them off. Then I go through the list a second time. This time I'm looking for people who are dissatisfied. That's a want too, isn't it? Because they want out of their situation. You know, so I go through the list and I say, who on this list wants out of their job? Who, uh, who hates who they work for, who they work with? Um, or who, who would like to move to a different location? Maybe their company transferred them to a certain city and they want to move back to where their family is. Um, who on this list is in debt? Who on this list um, loves to travel? You know? And so I check off those people. Maybe they're dissatisfied because they don't have enough vacation so they can't travel the way they'd like to. So, and you know who these people are because dissatisfied people, that's what they talk about when they're at social events. You ask them how it's going, they tell you how bad things are going or how, how they wish things were different. And then I go through my list a third time, and this time I check off people who maybe they're not dissatisfied, it's just that they want more. Maybe, uh, maybe they have a baby on the way and they need a bigger house. Or maybe they like to scuba dive, but they're landlocked and they only get a week's vacation, can never get anywhere far enough to, to enjoy uh, some beautiful scenery to scuba dive. So consequently, I check off those people as well. Now, everyone you've checked off is a want. They either want out of something or they want into something or they want more of something. They want. These are, that, that is your key to recruiting as far as I'm concerned. The key to recruiting is determining what a person's want is. Okay, now, you're getting ready to get to the invitation, but before you do, I'd like you to understand a few things. First of all, understand that recruiting, 80% of it is in preparation. And when I say preparation, I'm really talking about three or four things. Those three or four things would be belief, maybe confidence, posture, backup. What do I mean by that? Well, you need to work on your belief in your company and your belief in yourself. Because if you don't believe and you're talking to someone, it oozes out of your pores. They can, they can feel it. They can tell when, you, when, you're, when, you're, when you're not fully engaged, you're not fully committed. You know, I learned this a long time ago, you know, no one wants to be a part of your test, you know? So you either need to be all in or all out. In other words, you can't, you've got to step off the curve. You've got to make the decision. I'm going to go for this. I'm fully in. I believe in this business. I believe in myself. And you know, the more you believe in the business, the more you believe in yourself, the more confidence you're going to have. And confidence is what you want to ooze out of your pores. You want people to see confidence. You know, in the beginning, I didn't have a lot of confidence. And so I learned something called mirroring confidence. And what that meant was you mirror someone who is confident. So I used to think to myself, um, what if I was the president of the Chase Manhattan Bank? How would I act? How would I talk? How would I dress? How would I shake hands? And I started to mirror that image. 
And so what my posture was, my posture was confidence. And not, you know, once I started mirroring that, eventually I, I became that. I became confident. I became that person I was mirroring. And so that's, that's critical is your posture, your confidence in your posture. Backup is merely having a backup. In other words, if I'm going to talk to someone about the business or I'm going to invite someone to the business, I want to have a backup of certain videos, um, maybe certain brochures, maybe certain uh, training, certain things that I can show them or stream to them so that they can um, get verification or validation of what this business is all about. Also, another backup would be my sponsor or an upline that I could use on a three-way call or I could bring on to the call to tell their story and explain you know, what they've experienced in the business and what brought them into the business. And then the other thing would be uh, to understand that you are a solution. I tell people you are a solution looking for a problem. You know, and when you think of it that way, if you, you, you tune your ears to constantly listening to what people have to say, and um, it, will, it, will, um, it will help you figure out what it is that they want that you could help, that you could present the business and solve that particular problem. Stay emotionally detached from the results. This is the hard part. If anything will, will uh, be an obstacle in a business like this, it's the psychological, the emotional end of the business. In other words, you have to stay emotionally detached. It doesn't matter if they say yes or no. They're all equal. It doesn't make any difference. You know, you have to stay emotionally detached because success is how many times you show it, not who says yes and who says no. You can't control that anyway. You know, fall in love with the process. That's success is in the show. Show, 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 show. Understand yeses and nos are equal in the fact that I, I use an example. Let's say that this was a... Um, an iPhone, and it was a $1,000 iPhone, and every time I sold it, I made $100. If I showed this phone to 10 people, and the first one said, no, I already have a phone, second one said, no, I don't need a phone, third one said, no, but the 10th one said, yes, I didn't make $100 on the 10th one, I made $10 every time I showed the business. You have to get that mentally in your head, and once you do, you'll understand it's the process that you're going to fall in love with. The yeses and nos are not important. What's important are the numbers. You know, how many times do you show the business? The other thing, and this is just a tip, I always separate the invitation from the presentation because it elevates the presentation. In other words, if I invite someone to see the business, I set up a time to show it because it's that important that they have uninterrupted time to, uh, to hear it. All right. So let's talk first about people you know. When I invited people I know, I, I have three different approaches that I use, a direct approach, an indirect approach, and a product approach. So you might take notes on this because I'm going to move quick. The direct approach means I know what their want is. That, that's the best one. I'm coming straight at them. The indirect approach is I'm really talking about someone else hoping to get them interested. And the product approach has to do with purely product. So let me start with the direct approach. The direct approach has four steps to it. I call it the intro, the want, the lock-in, the close. When I first started to, to realize that recruiting was that critical to success and that that was the main, the highest paid skill to learn, I used to go around to some of the most successful people and I would record them on their different uh, invitations. And I had a book, a notebook full of invitations and I'd be memorizing and memorizing and memorizing. And then I realized there was nothing duplicatable about that. And you know, this is a business of duplication, which means you not only, it not only has to be duplicatable, but it has to be teachable. I want to teach something that, you know, I want to teach my front line to teach their front line how to teach their people how to recruit. So it has to be duplicatable. It has to be simple. This is simple. The other thing I needed in this direct approach is I worked all day. I went to grad school at night. I, sometimes I only had 30 minutes to make a call. I needed to be on and off the phone in three minutes. And this is the way I did it. Let me show you how it works. The intro was merely I call someone, say, hey, this is Paula. I've only got a minute. I've got to be somewhere. I've got to be in an appointment. The reason I say that is because I don't want them to ask me questions. Now, I didn't try to fake excitement or anything because, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to be straightforward and I've got to be somewhere. Therefore, they probably won't ask me questions. And if they do, I can revert back to the fact I've got to be somewhere. So that was the intro. This is Paula. Listen, I've got to be somewhere, but I called you for a reason. That's the intro. The one is, you told me a while back you wanted, 
whatever it is. You wanted to get out of your job, or you wanted a, a, a new house, or you wanted a new car, or you wanted to get out of debt. You told me a while back, whatever it was, that's the want. Then I go to the lock-in. This is key. Were you serious, or were you just kidding around? People don't like to contradict themselves, so nine chances out of 10, they'll say, I'm serious, if they said it before, that they wanted this. And then I say, listen, I think, not I'm sure, I think I might have a way to help you get it. I can't get it, go into it now. When do you have some uninterrupted time we could talk? I want to run an idea past you. That's it. That's the whole invitation. So, you know, uninterrupted time means no kids, no phones, no dogs, no, no uh, television, nothing. You know, just I, they are going to set aside quiet time. And, <clears throat> of course, run an idea past you is such a relaxed statement. It doesn't sound... It doesn't sound aggressive at all. And so this was what I used. I, I, just, I just exchanged the want depending on the person. Then I had the indirect approach. This I, I used for people I knew that, that lived in, in areas that were long distance. For example, um, and I used the same intro, but the key was, who do you know? Let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, they lived in another country. The world's flat now. When I started, long distance was 50 miles away. <laughs> But, you know, now, now the world's flat, so it can be any, dis let's say it, they lived in Chicago. I call and say, hey, this is Paula, hey, how you doing? We need to catch up sometime. I've only got a minute, though. I called you for a reason. And this is what I'd say. I'm looking to expand a business in Chicago. I thought you might know someone who might be interested in uh, an, a, a business of their own. It could mean an extra, and I throw out an income range. You know, it might be an extra two to four thousand a month, or three to five, depending on what I think is not too much, not not too low, to to not have interest, but not too high to be unbelievable. And then I I, uh, I say, who do you know? And what's interesting about that is, who do you know is an open-ended question that requires a name. If I say, do you know anyone? That that that's a closed end, and they could just say no, yes or no. And so I say, who do you know? And you, you would be amazed how many times they say, well, I'm not sure I know anybody, but I might be interested. What's it all about? Then I go right into my, the same clothes that I was doing before, which is, when do you have some uninterrupted time we could talk? Because if you remember, the intro was, I've only got a minute. So, you know, nothing aggravates me more than when people call, and the minute they get you on the phone, it's like they want to tell you everything all in one swoop. And I, they don't realize what a bad impression that leaves. So that's the indirect. As far as the product, very similar. Only with the product, if I have someone who is a really good customer, and I might tell them, you know, you know, reconfirming what a great product this is. In fact, it's in high demand. I've got more business than I can handle. In fact, I'm looking to, to expand my business. And at which point I says, who do you know that could use some serious income? Who do you know that could use some extra income? Who's the sharpest person you know? And what's interesting is some of the sharpest people they know will be some other relative, maybe their, their uh, daughter, maybe their cousin, maybe themselves. Maybe they're such a believer in the product, they'll say, you know, I might be interested. What's that all about? So I, I've turned more customers into distributors who ended up talking about the product to other people. So those are three approaches that I use. You know, now let's talk about acquaintances. Acquaintances are people that I might not know what their want is. I know them, we know each other, but I don't know what their want is. So I'm going to give you three options. The first one is ask questions to discover what their want is. And then you can go back and use the direct approach. You know, once you, you know, I know this direct approach and indirect approach so well, you could wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I could do it. You know, I'm only learning one thing, one, one way to contact people. It's not, it's duplicatable, it's teachable, and I'll go back and using the direct approach, even acquaintances, once I ask questions and discover what their want is. How do I do that? I learned this early on, and I have to tell you, I still use it today. It's called FORM, F-O-R-M, Family, Occupation, Recreation, Message. It's message. You know, I never learned it. That's the way I learned it from the very beginning. Message. You make a decision whether you want to deliver the message. I tell people, go out on a fact-finding mission. Find out what people want in life. How do I do that, Paula? Well, you go out and you ask them about their family. Hey, do you live around here? Oh, really? You got kids in the school down there? Oh, you live in that house? Oh, no, you live in the trailer park. Oh, but you'd like to live in that community up there on the hill. Yeah, oh, well, and then I might ask them about their job. I, how's your job? I bet you love it. Oh, you hate it? 
Well, you know, I, you know, if you say, I bet you hate it, they'll tell you they love it. So tell them, I bet you love it, and they'll tell you what's wrong with it. And, um, and then we get to recreation. What do you like to do for fun? They say, well, I really like to fish. Really? What kind of boat do you have? Oh, you can't afford a boat. Oh, but if you could, what kind would you have? And they start telling me. And so I have a file cabinet in my head, and I'm going, okay, they want this kind of boat. They want to live in this kind of house. They wish they uh, could get out of this job, or they do, they'd rather be doing another job. So I have a file cabinet, and what I do is I, I, ha I keep a journal. And then I'll, I'll come back, and I'll continue the conversation. Or I might decide they want this one so bad, I'm going to use that in my direct approach. So I'll come back, and I say, you know, you told me the other day, you, I couldn't get our conversation out of my mind. You told me you wanted this. Were you serious or were you kidding around? Listen, I think I got away. You can have it. I can't go into it now. When's your next day off? When can we talk? I want to run an idea past you. And so the direct approach fits right into this, even with acquaintances. Can I also use the indirect approach? Absolutely. You know, and the indirect approach with acquaintances, um, I could say, hey, I'm looking to expand a business around here, wherever they live or wherever their job is. Same thing with the indirect approach. But here's a new one. This is what I call my location approach, in a sense. And this is something I used frequently, um, especially when a network company has events in different parts of the United States or different parts of the world. I'll say to them, you know, uh, in my local area, I'll ask everyone I know. Let's say we were having an event in Orlando. Well, let's say I live in, um, in Ohio. I'll, I'll say to everyone I know, who do you know in Orlando? Who do you know in Orlando? Who do you know in Orlando? And they always say, why? And I'll say, because I'm looking to expand a business in Orlando. It could mean this kind of money. Who do you know? And you know, invariably, we'll come back to either they know somebody or what I consider expanding it in Ohio, where I live. So it's, I used to use this all the time. In fact, let me give you an example. Um, the company I was with at one time was expanding into the United Kingdom. I asked everyone I knew, who do you know in the United Kingdom? Who do you know in the United Kingdom? Who do you know? I had a list of people a mile long. And when I went to the United Kingdom, I called every one of them. And I said, you don't know me, but I'm a friend of so-and-so. Do you know how powerful that is? When you have, when you have a, a reference, it gives you instant credibility. And they go, oh, how's so-and-so? And I go, they're doing great. I promised them I'd contact you when I got to the United Kingdom. We have a company, very successful, we're expanding here, it could mean some serious money. Does this sound like anything you'd like to talk about further? And some of them would say yes, some of them would say no. Those that said yes, I set up a private appointment, I showed them the business, some of them said yes and some of them said no. But you know, at the end of that, without knowing anyone in the United Kingdom, my business was doing a million dollars in volume every single month, 12 months later. So I know it works. I live and breathe everything I'm teaching you. So then you're going to have people you don't know. Where are those people? Everywhere. They're in the bank line. They're at the motor vehicle license place. They're at, they're at the grocery store. They're also on social media. They're in social media. They're people that you might strike. Maybe you're part of a certain group. Um, maybe it's a group that uh, rides horses. Maybe it's a a group that's fans of a certain uh, football club. Maybe you belong to a group. And what you're trying to do is move people you don't know to acquaintances. So you strike up conversations with these people. And the idea is to move them, move them to an acquaintance. And you know, you do that by asking questions. You know, so you know you're trying what you're trying to do is focus on commonalities. Oh, you live here. Oh, you have kids that are in the same school district. Oh, we have, you know, we've been riding horses since this age. I have too, you know. And so you're, you're trying to take somebody with the same um, interest and trying to move them to acquaintance, to someone you're starting to know. And in the process of that, because you're asking questions all the time, you're getting to know them. And so I know on social media, I remember... Um, Initially, people would go into chat rooms and they'd be chatting back and forth and developing relationships. Uh, now you have all different kinds of formats or platforms that you can get to know people on. I also know that there's, you can also put out teasers, you know, looking to expand a business or you can put out teasers um, and, and boost those, you know, on social media. Social media has, has just changed everything. I mean, it's, it's really made the world flat, and it's really given you the opportunity. At the same time, maybe you want to focus in building in a certain country. And so you put yourself 
in a place where you can meet people from that different country, and then you can start up conversations. Um, this is one thing I always teach. Never invite someone to see the business at the same time that you're collecting information. So if I'm doing form, F-O-R, F -O -R, and I'm not delivering the message, I'm doing F-O-R, I'm going to deliver the message later. And so I'm going to be talking to someone about their family, their occupation, what do they do for fun, what's their recreation. I'm going to come back later, maybe the next day, and say, you know, I couldn't get our conversation out of my mind. You know, you told me you wanted this. Were you really serious or were you just kidding around? And they say, no, Paul, I was really serious. And at which time, <clears throat> and I want, I want to say one thing about the way I do this. I'm trying to eliminate skepticism. And by eliminating skepticism, you best do that by focusing on what people want. They know they brought it up to me. I probably wouldn't have been mentioning that I might have a solution had they not brought that up to me. So it removes the skepticism from everything. <clears throat> so consequently, I never deliver the message at the same time with only one exception. If I'm in a place where I'm meeting someone and we probably will never meet again, maybe I'm, <clears throat> maybe I'm at the uh, uh, license bureau and I'm getting a license, I'm sitting next to someone, we strike up a conversation, um, I might deliver the message then, but I'll take a pause. In other words, I'll collect the information, I'll take a pause, and then I'll say exactly what they think. And that would be, you know, I'll say to them, I know this sounds crazy, but are you serious when you, <clears throat> when you say you want out of that job? Are you serious when you say you're looking for an opportunity? And they say yes and say, I, I, this is not the time, but I'm expanding a business. I might have something you may be interested in. Why don't we exchange phone numbers? I'll give you a call. We'll get together. I'll run an idea past you. That would be the only time that I would actually do the invitation at the same time I'm collecting the information. You know, this is a good teaching technique because I tell people, you know, you, you, you know, this is a career. You know, I spent four years getting my undergraduate, another year getting my graduate, and then we had a number of years to get the PhD. <clears throat> and I have to tell you something. I studied, 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 practice, 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 but I could never reach the level of success that, you know, from a financial standpoint as you can in this business. So you need to give it the time it deserves. You need to practice, practice, practice. I tell people, go out and talk to people and practice FOR. You cannot deliver the message. I don't care if they say I'm looking for a network business. In fact, I'm looking for one that's in uh, youth enhancement products. You can't mention the business. You can't. <clears throat> and what's so great about that is they go out and they're relaxed and they strike up conversations because they're not, in the, they're not pressuring themselves to have to do an invitation at that moment. All they're doing is collecting information. I call it going on a fact-finding mission. And, <clears throat> you know, this, is, this has helped teach so many of my people in the business to really get comfortable with communicating because sometimes we spend so much time thinking about what we're going to say that we forget to listen to what they're saying. And what they're saying, there's so many clues as to why they need this business. My final thoughts. <clears throat> Understand that the way you invite someone to see the business is their first training. So it's important that you leave a good impression. It's important that you, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's important that you um, are not pushy, that you're not aggressive, it's important that you're doing as much evaluation of them and, and as, as anything. In other words, you're interviewing people. <clears throat> you have the right to choose the people you want to be associated with. You're interviewing them. So you have to realize that, um, you know, like in any job situation, that person needs to be showing you why they would qualify for your time because it's going to cost you time and money uh, to get someone started and work with them initially. So anyway, the way you invite is their first training. Remember that. Because I've seen people <clears throat> who, who decided not to get involved in network marketing because the person that introduced them was pushy or aggressive or, you know, hounding them as if they're trying to sell them on it. 
You know, that's the last thing you want to be doing. You know, your biggest success will come after your biggest disappointment. <clears throat> ah. And what I mean by that is if I look back on my career, some of my biggest disappointments when somebody I really wanted in the business and they said no. And, you know, I, I, I make a joke about this, but there was a time when if someone said a no to me, it is like a three second disappointment. I turned it into three weeks. I mean, I wouldn't approach anyone for another three weeks. You know, I was letting my emotion, uh, and, you know, my emotion interfere with my building of the business instead of turning it into a three second disappointment like it deserved. And in other words, one, two, three, next. One, two, three, next. Something that you need to work on. You can't, you've got to separate the emotional part of it. Understand that, you know, people say no to the business. They're not saying no to you. They're saying no to the business. You know, I think about that when, when a Girl Scout shows up and wants to sell me Girl Scout cookies. You know, some I'll buy and they come back again. Maybe I won't. But I'm not saying no to the Girl Scout. I'm saying no to the cookies. You know, you have to separate that. Understand amateurs convince. We have a saying that professionals sort, amateurs convince. The last thing you want to do is convince and coax someone to get in the business. Because if you have to convince and coax them, you're going to have to convince and coax them into doing something. And that's the last thing you want to be doing in this business. So please don't coax. If anything, they should be trying to convince you to pick them. Make rejection your friend. Understand that, you know, this is the real key to success in the business. And that's how you handle rejection. And you've got to make it your friend. Remember I talk about yes and no are equal? Well, yeah, that's a no. So understand that they're all the same. They all, it's numbers. How many numbers you go through will determine what you get paid. And focus on what you control. This is the part I try to really get across to people. Focus on what you can control. You know, you, if you invite someone to see the business, you can't control whether they say yes or no. If they say yes and you do the presentation, you can't, you can't uh, determine if they get in the business or not. And even if they get in the business, you have no control over whether they do something. But you spend 90% of your time worrying about things you can't control. You know what you can control in this business? How many people you talk to. That's it. That's all you control. How many people do you talk to? That's it. You can't control uh, if any of those people you talk to want to see the business. You can't control if they, if they get in the business. You can't control if they do anything if they get in the business. You can't control any of it. And I'm going to tell you, I, you know, there's many times when people say yes, they get in, and they do nothing. So you get all that excitement just to be disappointed. So you've got to take the emotions out of it. You know, I don't, I, you know, I don't go up or down in my emotions. I'm just kind of level. Wait and see what happens. Yes, they got in. Oh, that's great. Wait and see what happens. Oh, they said no. Oh, that's too bad. I would like to work with them. But you just got to level it out <clears throat> and be willing to be vulnerable. This is something I think I didn't understand it when I was doing it, but I, you know, I thought I was showing courage. I wanted this business so bad. I would, um, it didn't matter if you said yes or no, it didn't matter um, what, how many people I had to talk to. There got, there, I came to a point where I wanted it so bad I was just going to lay myself out there no matter what. You know, if it meant streaking through town, I guess maybe I would have done that. I would have done anything. I really wanted to succeed. But, you know, I realize now when you make yourself vulnerable, and that means be willing to take the, the bumps, and there will be bumps, be willing to take the nose, not take it personal, um, things will start to really change for you. You know, uh, Brene Brown wrote a book called Daring Greatly, and she talks about, you know, how important courage is to success. But in order to have courage, you've got to be willing to be vulnerable. You've got to be willing to lay yourself out there. You know, take the ups and the downs. Be willing to take the punches. And, you know, I, if I can say anything to all of you out there watching, is if you can just, you know, make the decision, step off the curb, crack the egg, make a no, no turning back decision, and then say, I'm in this for the long haul. And you have to understand, when I was... When I started network marketing, network marketing wasn't that popular. Now it's like an accepted profession. But at that time, I really had to have tough skin. I had to put on my, uh, as I call it, my psychological armor. 
that, you know, I, I used to think to myself mentally, bullets can't penetrate this armor, neither can arrows, uh, neither can nose. And I would go out there and I just put myself out there. And you know what? I, you know, I did it anyway. And, you know, we talk about pushing through the fear. You know, f you know, people think that sometimes that having courage to do a business like this means a lack of fear. And it isn't. You know, what it is, it's, it's feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And that's what I did. I felt the fear. I did it anyway because it's something I had never had to do before. And in the process, I grew as a person. I grew a fantastic business. And I know all of you can do the same. So I want to wish you the best. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And uh, we'll see you at the top.